before we get started with this episode of The Space Between Your Ears, gotta talk to you again like we have been over the last few months about our friends over at Mohawk Honda, Freeman's Bridge Road, over in Scotia, Glenville, where they go out of their way to please you. You know, it's a tough time, continues to be, even throughout the summer, you know, the, about trading in your vehicle, you know, when you want to trade in, it's a case of you can go to certain lots and they'd be more than willing to pay you for your vehicle. That's because they don't really have a whole lot of inventory to sell vehicles. So they're just trying to build up their inventory to eventually turn it around down the road. So that leaves you empty handed you with cash in hand going, all right, now what for me? Well, with these current supply and demand challenges, you know, it's the perfect time of year for you to get top dollar. So in order to make sure you get top dollar and then can turn around and get a vehicle, you want to go to Mohawk Honda right now to take advantage of their Kelly Blue Book instant cash offer. Cash in hand, same day you come in, even if you don't end up buying from Mohawk Honda, they'll still take care of you and make sure you get a pretty sweet deal, especially if you're a recent college grad or a student in need of a new ride or even just some extra cash in your pocket. Mohawk Honda, they've consistently had their lot fully stocked with hundreds of certified pre-owned vehicles. Large inventory makes shopping fun as you browse through the many makes and models on their lot. And you can also check out their full selection online at MohawkHonda.com. So make sure you stop in and say hi to guys like Greg Johnson, their assistant GM, uh, Jake Doyle, Oil, Luis, the VIP man Morales, or any one of the many helpful sales consultants over there, Mohawk Honda. Vast selection of Honda certified pre owned vehicles. And now is the time to take advantage with their Kelly Blue Book instant cash offer. Mohawk Honda, Freeman's Bridge Road, Scotia, Glenville, where they always go out of their way to please you. Also, real quick, want to mention our friends over at Johnstone Supply, where you know, it's it's that time of year we talked about how you want to make sure your AC units were up and running fresh throughout the course of the summer. Now we're starting to get into the colder months and I got to start asking the questions. Do I need a new heating system? Do I need to service my furnace, get things changed out, upgrade the system maybe? Well, Johnstone Supply and Troy can make sure your home is heated properly for this colder weather on the way. It's a family-owned and operated business for six decades, and they've been helping upstate New York residents all that time. For more information, again, visit them 6th Avenue in Troy. Whether you're trying to find the proper change for your filters, make sure your home is heated properly for the new weather, look into your furnace, the whole nine. Everybody at Johnstone Supply is ready to answer any questions you may have. Again, Johnstone Supply, 6th Avenue in Troy. Give them a call today, 518-272-5922. And hey, episode 15 of The Space Between Your Ears right here on YouTube. If you're checking out the video, if you're just doing the audio versions on Google Play, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, we thank you for that as well. Make sure you give us a like and subscribe. Give us a review. <sighs> We're presented by Godzilla Media and sponsored by our friends at Mohawk Conda and Johnstone Supply. And uh, I got somebody joining me today that a lot of you might know the voice, not necessarily the face, because she's been a big part of... The radio industry over, oh, last 15, 20 years or so, uh, both here in the Capital Region. She also spent a little time out in Omaha. She's been doing stuff in Boston. She's all over the place. My good friend, Marissa Lanchak. Marissa, hi. <laughs> What's going on, buddy? Not much. I'm And I, uh, as, a, as a, uh, a fellow radio person... Uh, I apologize for you having to sit through ad reads, but you know what that's like. It's all good. I know. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. You got to make your money somehow, brother. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, let's just, because I know it's been a while since we've uh, last had any kind of a uh, lengthy conversation of sorts, and that's that's on me, really. Um, but aside from that, how have you been? How have you been holding up? I'm good. Uh, you know, it's been a crazy couple of years. Uh, I'm back here in New York and, um, you know, I wasn't sure how everything was going to pan out with this pandemic, but, you know, I'm doing okay. I've got, I've got a, a full-time job where I'm teaching some vocal classes, some vocal coaching. Uh, so that for like um, any of the stuff that you hear for commercials or audio books, people love to just like gobble up audio books and don't realize all the effort that gets put into those things. Uh, but I'm teaching people basically how to make those, um, uh, entertaining enough where people want to listen. Uh, that and uh, I have four radio stations I'm doing from home here in just in my basement. So, um, so yeah, it's been it's been an interesting ride these last couple of years. 
you know, just just a few jobs, nothing nothing crazy, just you know, just, yeah, just fill in time, no big deal. <laughs> uh, so, so let's just kind of <laughs> let's just kind of rewind and go back in time a little bit. Um, and let's go back to Marissa the kid growing up in the area. Um, you know, growing up, you know, just what was it like just growing up with your family, you know? Um, you know, obviously, you know, I, I know the fam, so I have a general idea of, you know, how, you know, a great family you got, but just discuss a little bit growing up and, you know, maybe were you recognized mental health issues along the way? Uh, what, what, I'm sorry, finish, what was the last part of that? Because you were breaking up a little bit at the end. Well, just, just, just to, just kind of go over, you know, like, like, you know, what was it, a, you know, like growing up for you, um, you know, within your community and with your family and just maybe where you feel like, um, you know, mental health started to become something you recognize within your life. I mean, I would say it probably stems back to being a very tiny me uh, because, I mean, I don't talk about it very often, but, you know, every once in a while I'll bring up my grandmother and, and people just assume that I'm talking about Nana uh, because Nana has been a big part of my show here in the capital region amongst them. You know, so she's prevalently known. My dead parent, actually, when I was little, uh, they were like a second set of parents to me. Uh, so for me, from the time I was born until about eight or nine years old, they played a, a really uh, big part in, in my growing up. And uh, my grandfather actually passed away. He had oh, a number of things, but God, I think it you know, came down to, he had like seven heart attacks when everything was said and done. And you know, the, that last one just kind of took him. Uh, I was six years old uh, at that point. And then not long after he passed, my grandmother, my dad's mom, found out that she had cancer. Uh, she had stomach cancer. And at one point, I think it was like a, a, a orange sized ball of cancer was just in her stomach that they had to try to remove. Um, so, I mean, we ended up, she dealt with that for a couple of years. And, you know, when I was about eight years old, it was the end of 91 leading into 92. Um, we brought her back home. They basically said they couldn't do anything else for her. Uh, and that Christmas, that New Year's, it was spent with my grandmother in her house. We had moved in and we were taking care of her and uh, basically like spent Christmas around the hospital bed. And, um, you know, I slowly watched her. And I very much remember because she ended up being in a coma uh, near the end. And I remember the last morning, her, like I, little eight year me, by the hospital bed, I was holding her hand. And I must have said, I loved like a million times. And I even said bye a bunch of times. And like my mom would take me over to get the bus. This is about to fall. <laughs> um, my mom would take me over to get the bus. And uh, I guess it's like she came back. And they, they like saw her take a last breath. Basically, my my uh, my aunts and a couple aunts were with her uh, while my mom was taking a shower. Uh, because like I guess hospice says like whoever whoever they're closest with, they will do whatever they can to to not take that final breath with them in the room. Um, so I had left. Mom was taking a shower. Dad was somewhere else. You know, just my grandmother's sisters were downstairs with her. Uh, but. Yeah, I mean, that would be for me where I think I, I noticed a, a difference for me because it kind of felt like I lost a second set of parents, you know, so it was it was pretty heavy uh, for, for me at, at just eight years old trying to figure out how to deal with that as an only child. And I know hospice tried to talk to me because they have like therapy for kids, but I was also an incredibly shy kid. I kept everything in. So I, I wasn't about to uh, tell anybody how I was feeling. Uh, but, you know, for me, I think like I still like if I think hard enough about it or too long about it, I still cry, you know, when it comes to that scenario, just because, you know, here it is almost 30 years later that but that that was a very tragic, traumatic, um, you know, experience for me. 
uh, you know, growing up. So as you obviously, um, you know, that's, that's a horrible, horrible situation for any kind of, um, kid to go through, especially given your situation where you're an only child and, you know, you know, being an only child household, you know, obviously you're going to have a lot close relationships and get to know family better than, <clears throat> better than, um, you know, have more quality time, I guess would be the best way to put it than, you know, those that are in a bigger family. But as you, as you moved on and, and eventually progressed into high school, you know, obviously now you, you you're starting to think about, you know, what you're going to do as far as college and life in general. How, what was it like for you, you know, just going through high school and being able to be in that, you know, social scenario? Any, was there any social anxieties or um, anything so socially awkward at all for you going through high school? Um, yeah, I I have some trust issues. I'll admit that. And, you know, friends definitely played into that. And, um, you know, who knows? Like this whole situation with my grandparents may have just had me grow up a lot quicker than than my peers. So I, I feel like I may have always been a little bit more mature and a little bit more responsible than, um, you know, a lot of the people around me. And, and, and I cared a little bit differently, right? So like, I really cherish the people around me, the people I care about. Like I always give 110% in any kind of friendship relationship that I have. Um, and I don't think a lot of people are like accustomed to that. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's made it where when people hurt me it really does, it hurt when, uh, it might be for somebody, I can't else. I do, I, I, fitting what's happened. Um, so like, as an example, uh, it seems like everybody that I've always considered to be like a really good friend to me has, has done something at some point. So, you know, even I can think back to like, maybe it was like fifth grade. Um, it was like these, gr this group of girls that I was friends with and we were like, really, right. But I was always the more athletic kid. Like I always just like getting dirty and having fun and not really caring. And we're in that transition of, you know, 10, 11, 12, where it's like, you know, Puberty's kind of taking place and, you know, some girls are being all girly girls and I'm just like, I don't care. I, I roll around, you know, I get along with the guys much better than I do with the girls. Uh, but because of that, you know, one day I found that all of a sudden my best friends were no longer my friends and they were calling me names. Like I, I very vividly remember being called Raymond. Like all of a sudden I wasn't Marissa anymore. I was Raymond. <laughs> and I, I remember telling my parents about it. And there's always been that sarcastic me, like silly me. And I, I don't know when that started, but it's, I mean, for as long as I can remember, because I remember saying, Raymond, what is the problem? So, you know, even at the same time, this will take a joke out of the scenario. Um, but you know, it's always been, uh, I've, I've had a lot of scenarios like that where it's like, I'll be really close with somebody and, and the relationship just doesn't stick for whatever reason. And I, I do think it comes down to, I, I tend to care more and people aren't accustomed to, the, to actually having people care about them. So I don't know. That's just how it goes for me. By the way, you, you, you said something that I could connect to a little bit because you, you talked about how you were the girl who, uh, and just got along better with guys and girls. And I'm basically the reverse of that. I'm the guy that gets all girls better than guys. Uh, I don't know. It's a weird dynamic. I don't know why. Um, but that's something like, uh, but another thing I, that you mentioned that I can relate to was, um, the maturity. Um, now it's a little different for me because I I was I grew up in a household where I was the oldest of three, so for me, it was kind of like I was expected to set the example more or less in my household. So, plus I knew that my grandparents like like stringent old school Catholics like so like. 
just I could I had I, I had no room, no wiggle room for messing around before I got out of high school. Like it was, you know, you're doing your schoolwork, you're going to church every weekend. Did, 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 did. Like it was, it, there was no wiggle room for me. Um, so I can I can totally relate because like I'd be there just kind of like in my own little world, and then there would be. A group of guys right next to me talking about, oh, you know, it's this party this weekend. Oh, this girl was so messed up and all that stuff. And I'm just like, I watched the Yankees over the weekend. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, uh, there's, there was, did, did that make it harder for you making friends? Or did you find that actually a little easier because you could pinpoint who had, like, the same kind of thinking as you? It, did, it made it hard for me up until a certain point, I feel like, because throughout elementary school, I always felt like I connected better with friends' parents than I did with my actual friend, it, it, which was really, it's a weird dynamic um, because, you know, as I got older, like, I did find, like, you know, some of my better friends, even now, like, they're 15, 20 years older than me, um, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that by any means, uh, you know, it's just, I can be friends at this point with various age groups, but then I can tell in some cases where I'm like, mm, I just can't put a lot of air because I have a feeling that this is just going to get dramatic <laughs> because somebody just hasn't learned yet, you know, like, so I, I've learned over the course of time, you know, where to put more effort in uh, than, than not. Uh, but I would say, yeah, I mean, throughout school, it was definitely a, a challenge just because, I, I, I don't like drama, you know that, like I, you know, so it's like, I just, I tried to like stay to myself at points until I found somebody that was worthwhile. You have your mic at all. I'm an idiot, sorry. Um, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so you get through high school, and I remember, if I remember off the top of my head, you end up going to Hudson Valley. Um, in your time at Hudson Valley, yeah. what eventually made you decide that radio was the thing for you at the time? I mean, I actually made that change when I was about 12, uh, but I was incredibly shy. So, like, when I brought it up to my mom at one point, because I was like, I want to do that, and I pointed at the radio, she she actually laughed at me um, because I was so incredibly shy. Like, I mean, I couldn't even get up in front of the class and, like, give a presentation ever. Like, I would sweat, I would stutter, I wouldn't be able to project, like, I mean, all these things. Um, you know, so for me... Uh, you know, for the people that I was closest with, I was always an entertainer. You know, I was always trying to make somebody laugh and, you know, I was trying to, um, you know, make people happy. And I think, you know, maybe that could also go back to, you know, when my, my grandparents passed away and just like the sadness that surrounded for a while. Um, and I just didn't like being in that kind of sadness. So like, you know, I was always trying to bring smiles. Um, now, I remember my first first little bit of entertainment, uh, I would do Michael Jackson impersonations because like, you know, I'm a kid of the nineties, so who wouldn't? Uh, so, you know, it's back, but, um, you know, I did that, I was radio, but I again was very shy. So I just, I guess I always focused on the backup plan, which was photography at, at that point. Um, and I, uh, fine arts major in high school, I was a fine arts major at Valley. And I had some bad teachers, so there's that. Uh, but then I also just so much art in such a short, short period of time that I was just, I think, overly immersed with it and just got sick of it. Uh, and then I graduated too, and I was like, I don't even know what to do with this degree. But my final semester there, I had to make myself full time uh, for all of the, you know, the aid that I was getting uh, financially, and. I started taking uh, acting class because I was trying to break out of the shyness. I knew I wanted to. Here's a little side note. Hudson Valley wouldn't let me take public speaking. I tried three times. They said it was not a part of my curriculum. 
and it honestly should be a part of everybody's curriculum. <laughs> uh, and I don't know why they were denying me time and time again, uh, but this was me trying to break from the shyness. Um, so I was like, what's the next best thing? Well, acting classes. So I took acting one and acting two. I took television production. Um, I auditioned for a couple of the plays and you know, I actually surprised myself because I did rather well. Had they not been musicals, I probably would have felt a little bit more comfortable uh, and maybe actually gotten cast. But, um, you know, those those things did lead me in the right direction. And I ended up at the radio school in town. And that was where I, you know, I said to my parents, I'm like, I don't know what to do with this art degree. I, I want, I think, to try out this radio school and just see what happens. Um, and I remember my dad being like, well, if you audition and you get in, you know, go ahead. Um, so I did, I auditioned, I got in, I was there for a month and I got my first job. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like sometimes you just, you know, what you're meant to do it's just a matter of having the courage and the, um, the drive and, and the persistence and the want to, to actually move forward and go along with it and just see what happens. So that's what it was for me. Now, to fast forward a little bit, um, you eventually, and I don't remember the exact timing of this, so forgive me, um, you spend a little time working locally at radio stations, and then you get a chance to uh, potentially take a step forward in your career, and you move out to Omaha. Um, yes. How... You're not in Omaha for long before you come back home. So, like, how did the, that move and that whole situation of being out in Omaha and being, you know, because this is your first time really away from home, really, for you. Um, yeah. How, yeah. How much did that, like, how much did that affect your mental health and trying to, you know, put yourself in a situation where you feel like you fit in and you're comfortable out in Omaha and then eventually making that decision to come back home. I mean, it wasn't very long and that back to mental health. Wait, now it's for my career. That's when I could it wasn't a move that I necessarily wanted to initially make, but you know, I had a mind that was pushing me in that direction. So I was just like, okay. Um, and uh, so I moved out there and uh, I had a lot of things, a lot of things happen. And it just like kind of kept, um, you know how there's like, if you see cartoons, it's like a snowball, it's like it starts as a snowball. It's rolling and all of a sudden it's this big giant boulder of a, of a, uh, like just, just snow mound. Um, you know, that's what it kind of felt like for me is that it started off slow and then it just kind of kept building and building and building. And uh, I had moved there in July and uh, by October, my aunt and boyfriend got killed in a motorcycle accident. Um, there was some old older gentleman who probably shouldn't have been driving. And next thing you know, he ran through a red light and, and here we are. Um, and it was my mom's youngest sister. Uh, and it hit the family incredibly hard. Uh, and from there, it was like one thing after another. It, it was like, it, it was the for my life. Um, because then, you know, as the months went on, it led down to um, a lot of little things in between. But then like my Nana got really, really sick and nobody, no doctors could figure out what was wrong with her. So at Christmas time, I had made the, the choice of like, you know what? my hair's falling out. I'm so stressed out. And I'm only like 23 years old. And I'm like, I need to, I got to make the choice and I'm moving home. Uh, you know, if I lose my career, if I lose everything, you know, I would much rather that than potentially lose my grandmother and not be able to be here with her or for her. Um, so uh, I, I made that choice by April. Uh, I had moved back to New York and I really just kind of started from the ground up again. Uh, but it was, it was incredibly hard and i think honestly that itself is what made me realize like in this moment right now what's most important is my family you know and i always not but all of a sudden our trans in the middle of the country all these things start happening really get home you know it just puts like a really 
big spotlight on what men mean. You know, it made him realize like I my my ways to be home, and it was even more so at that moment that I just wanted to be happy, healthy, successful at home. Me, me and have the mic muted. Me and have the mic muted. I really need to stop that because that, either that or I just need to be a lot more mindful of it. Anyways, <laughs> all right. So you, you get yourself back home from Omaha, and like you said, you reestablish yourself and you, you know, you build yourself back up. And now you're like the afternoon show monster at Fly and whatever. Um, how much? Do you feel like? there were situations around your mental health. Cause this is something I found myself doing. Did you ever feel like when you had mental health issues going on, just situations in your life that were triggering, triggering your mental health? Um, did you find yourself doing what I did and just kind of diving deeper into your work to take the focus off that and kind of put that oh, stuff yeah. in the back? Corner? 100%. I mean, not for anything on the internet. I just touch on burner. You know, like, because I wouldn't, I'm all over. I wouldn't any deter from, from that. Are you able to see me? I'm still good on your end. Yeah, you're I good. I can't hear you again. You're good. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, yeah, I had a lot of things, you know, happening, but, like, I would never let that deter my, my career. Um, so, so, but, yeah, I mean, like, when I, when my brain, when I can't turn it off, I, I have to be focused on something positive for myself. Otherwise, I'll go crazy. Now, <laughs> all right, so... The question I'm about to ask is meant to be funny, so please don't take it too seriously. Um, and I'm going to preface the question by saying this. Uh, our friend Tom Goss says hi and says he's no longer as scared of you as he used to be. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm prefacing the question by saying that is because for entirely different reasons, I'm assuming, than what he has, and I don't know what his reasoning was. But I know when I first started working in the same building as you. I wouldn't say I was scared of you. I was, I guess, nervous about talking to you. I don't know why. Do you, is that like a normal thing that you run into at all? Or is it just me and Tom being really, really weird dudes and, and being afraid to talk to you? Uh, no, I... No, I have been told that I am intimidating, but I don't think it's me. I think it's, I think it's the perception um, that is put out that like, because I don't, I don't want this to come across like I'm tooting my own horn by any means. Because I like I I don't put my I don't have a gigantic ego. I, I'm very humble and and talent and and you know career. But I do know that I have been very prevalent in especially in this area of Albany for a very long time. Um, I had a lot of people that grew up listening to me, <laughs> um, which sounds makes me sound very old. <laughs> um, but I think because of that and because of just who I, I am. Like I've always put a lot of myself out there. Uh, so people have a feel like they feel like they know me, but then they, they meet me in person and they realize they don't actually know me, uh, that they are hesitant to come over. And I don't think it's like a scared or, um, intimidated in a negative way. I think it's like, like, holy crap. Like, Oh my God. Like, you know, it, it's more of like a, a momentary starstruck which I always think is really ridiculous because there's nothing star about me. <laughs> um, but, you know, a lot of people like to say, oh, well, you're a local celebrity. And I'm like, okay, if you say so. Like, I'm just doing a job. So to me, it doesn't seem that way. 
Uh, but I also am smart enough to kind of put the pieces together and can understand why somebody in, in a certain moment might feel a certain way. But I think that's what it comes down to is a slight intimidation because, oh my God, I've heard her for years and there, there she is now in front of me. And I don't want to like make her think that I'm a dick uh, for a lack of better word. <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong, Brian. Tell me well, no, because now, now that I think back, I honestly know where it came from with me. So we're going to kind of rewind because I kind of fast forwarded to when we were working together. But I'm going to rewind a little bit. So in 2009, I went to I was going to the same radio school you went to um, just much later than you. And um, and I would happen to be interning for much later. It was five years. <laughs> Whatever. So I ended up interning for at the time it was Brian Chrissy <laughs> and Jim in the mornings um at Fly. And the only reason I even got that good, because everybody else in my class was getting like promotions, internships, and stuff for their to fill their hours at new school. I I got the Brian Chrissy and Jim gig because I happen to know Brian since I was in high school. So that's just how I I wore my way in. Brian was like, I want him. Anyways. Um, so, and th okay, there. You, you tooted your own horn. Ends, I man. Gotta work those right, yeah. You tooted your own horn for a second. I just tooted mine by saying Brian wanted me specifically. Anyways. Um, so, I, I remember I'm interning for them. And around the time I'd finish doing my stuff for them in the mornings, everybody else is coming in the building. At like nine, ten o'clock in the morning. And anytime I saw you, about 95% of the time, and I eventually was able to put together why. For lack of a better phrase, you just look at the miserable bitch. And, and I wasn't sure if it was either A, something was going on with you, or B, you just hated life in the mornings. And I, I like, I just, I don't know. I just, so when I eventually came to work with you with, uh, with, uh, actually get a job there in 2013 I was like like I've heard she's a cool girl but like I'm about to do traffic for it I don't even know if I should go in and say hi like I don't know what to do um, and that's just me being dumb and now we're here talking on a podcast so that's that's well, my story about why I was scared when, when you guys would come out of the studio in the morning <laughs> when you guys would come out of the studio in the morning, I was in a meeting most of the time trying to get stuff done and could not hear a damn thing because y'all were so loud. So if I was getting a bitch face on, it's because I was trying to do my job, but nobody, I couldn't hear a freaking thing. <laughs> and that's with somebody who is on the other side of a cubicle wall, five feet from me. <laughs> so, so no, I'm not a miserable bitch by any means. Uh, <laughs> No, I, 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 I am I am well aware of that now. So uh, yeah, yeah. Just a poor, I guess we'll call it poor. Uh, yeah, we'll just call it poor judgment on my part, and 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 the loud part. By the way, just let's let's just let's just clarify this. I was not the loud one. I was the one just trying to do my job and be as anonymous as possible. Uh, it was the people I was working for that were being loud. Let's just make that clear, because they. They're always yeah. loud. Always. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I guess uh, to kind of dive a little deeper into the mental health stuff, I guess would be just the, uh, I guess the best way to put it is like just a series of unfortunate events that kind of happened with you and your career here that eventually led you to look outside the area again. As you went through the stuff you went through with transitioning from where you were um, with Fly and then eventually going to from a top 40 station to a country station, then from a country station to now eventually you end up going to Boston. How much did that stuff, because again, you mentioned how you had this Talk about a phrase, reputation for being Marissa. Oh, go boy. Like, like, did that, did that mess with you at all with having to make those transitions in such a short period of time? Or were you able to just kind of keep your head down and your nose to the grindstone and just keep going? Um, I, 
I mean, I'm always somebody who, when I get knocked down, I do whatever I can to get back up. Uh, I don't stay down for long. Uh, uh, but as you know, I mean, without going into a lot of detail about it, you know, while I was at, at Fly in 2013, 2014, uh, and 2015, I was dealing with uh, a very abusive relationship I was in. So, like, I was already dealing with a lot mentally. Um, I was at my absolute lowest and was in the healing process. Like, I was doing some things once I finally was able to, to take the courage to to step away like i was you know trying to take these steps in the right direction and, and focusing on me and, and my mental health and, and getting back to uh where i deserve to be and for me i was doing very very well <laughs> and again like my career i always put it first no matter what even through all that to the point where at fly um i was afternoons i was music director i was afternoon or uh, january when we got the ratings uh that that year in the beginning of 2015, um, 2016, excuse me, um, we, we found out that we had the biggest ratings book in 18 years. We were number one for the first time in 18 years overall, uh, which I had a huge hand in that. So, I mean, I was on cloud nine. I'm like, you know, I'm finally taking care of myself. Everything's going in the right direction. Everything feels great. I have my dream job because this is the job that I wrote down on my goal sheet at school. Um, so I was like super ecstatic. Uh, and then a month after that book came out, I was the budget cut, <laughs> um, you know, obviously somebody somewhere in the upper part of that company just kind of looked at the stations across the board and not station specific. And they just decided that any boss that wasn't an afternoon drive was getting moved there. And it didn't matter who was there, what they'd been doing or what their role in the station was, they were getting out of there. Um, and here I was, you know, I had been number one in afternoon drive for almost nine years. I was music director, so I really controlled the sound of the radio station for the same amount of time. Um, I had run the station myself for a moment. Uh, so like, you know, I, that station, it was like, it felt like my identity in a lot of ways. So when I got let go, um, not only did it feel like I was losing a giant chunk of me, but again, it was my dream job that I had written down and I had done so successfully for so long that it felt like, well, why was I working so hard? Um, you know, what did I do all that for? Why did I, you know, sacrifice every ounce of my social life? <laughs> uh, because that's what happens in this industry is it takes over a lot of, a lot of ways. Um, you know, why did I do all that for, for what, you know, like, a, 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 what at the end of the day, it didn't seem like anybody really appreciated what everything I had done. Um, now in that moment, I would just kind of felt like, well, great, there goes my career. You know, what, what did I do it all for? Because I didn't plan on moving. I didn't want to move. I have a house, you know, I'm in it right now. I didn't want to go anywhere else. Um, you know, I planned on setting my roots here, being with my family, being happy. You know, just like I said, when I got back from Omaha and then, you know, the next thing, it was the same day. Um, you know, I had a country station in town that, that called me immediately. And, uh, it was a situation that they, I mean, they wanted me, they came hard. It seemed too good to be true. It really was in a lot of ways. Uh, because here I was, um, you know, I signed on, I got there and they, they like wind and dine me for that first three months, you know, that, that newlywed moment. And then boom, the moment that 90 days was up, I got treated like everybody else in that company. Uh, and it was miserable. It was the worst, uh, career experience I think I've ever had, uh, working for a company, uh, which is why I will not name them in any kind of way. Uh, because I don't feel like they deserve it. <laughs> um, and I'm not the only one who has that same story. Literally every single person I think that has walked through those doors has a very similar story, whether it's in this market or another market, it's it, that company is what it seems. Um, so, you know, that in itself made me think, you know, I, I actually was at a point where I'm like, I hope that my career ends tomorrow because I did not want to work there anymore, uh, but I didn't know how to get out of it. And I didn't know where to go and I didn't know what to do. Um, and next thing, you know, that, that opportunity did come, uh, you know, like it was like August, I think of 2017, I welcomed it with open arms. I couldn't wait to clear out my office. Uh, and I came home and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be fine. I don't know why I felt that way, but I just felt like everything's going to be okay. And I, you know, I talked to a lot of people, but within that same week, I, I had gotten a phone call from uh, a program director in Boston, Massachusetts. 
I don't think he was familiar with me. I don't even really know how he found me. I think he found me in some trade article for radio and he came at me. He had never heard anything. He didn't know my resume. Um, he had me come out. I auditioned. I came home. He, he had me come out for an additional week uh, and fill in for, for somebody. And I was there for like a day and a half and got offered the job that was available. And I felt like this is, I mean, the money's not super great, but it's, you know, it's a great opportunity and uh, I couldn't turn it down. So I ended up in Boston and it took a lot for me to leave this, this house, leave this area, leave my friends and my family. Uh, but for me, while difficult at first, it was probably the best decision I could have made for my mental health because, you know, I had that abusive relationship and then I had all this other turmoil that had happened in my career uh, that I thought I was in a really good spot. Like I thought I was healing, but it turned out that I think it was masked a bit because I was so busy. Uh, and the moment that I was able to be out of the environment and be by myself a lot, uh, I, I had to face a lot of different things. And because of that, like I was able to face them head on and I was able to heal a lot of those things as well. Uh, and it, it really helped me get back to me in, in so many ways. So when this pandemic hit and I was kind of forced to leave that area of Boston, it was very difficult. It was a, it was a big turning point for me because I never, ever, ever thought any other city or place could feel like home. And that's that place actually started feeling more like home. And I think it was just because I was able to heal myself in so many positive ways uh, that coming coming back to my actual hometown and, and realizing that all of my stuff was following me, uh, you know, it was it was definitely a difficult transition. And uh, I will say, like, when I got back in this house for a moment, I did take a step back. But, um, you know, I did kind of revamp it all and and make it so it felt new again. And, um, you know, I was able to, you know, basically pick up where I left off in Boston. Um, so, you know, now I, I can feel good and, and happy that I've got two places that I can really comfortably call home and um, feel like I have uh, found myself again in, in both of those areas. Because it, it, it took a lot. You know, I, I went through a lot in a sh very short amount of time. Um, um, and, and there were times difficult that I didn't be able to get through them. Uh, but, you know, with a lot of determination and, and just like using any kind of anger or sadness that I was feeling to push me to a positive place, uh, I think that is what that is what really helped me get to the point that I am today. You know, it's funny you have this, this love for Boston because um, for as long as I can remember since getting married, my wife and I have, or have basically decided that once we decide we're able to get away and move away from, uh, and, and from family and maybe potentially look at a place for us to grow old and sit in rocking chairs on the porch. There's two places, Virginia beach or Boston. Like those are the two places we've, we've already locked those in. So like, I love the city of Boston, even though I'm a Yankees fan, um, I know you're a Yankees fan too. So, but still the city is, it's an amazing city. It's a great city. Um, and I, I'm right there with you as far as Boston's concerned. It, that, that city does hold a special place in my heart. It's expensive city. That's a one. <laughs> true, true, true. Especially those those little parking garages. Those can get really expensive. Um, but there's something about your life I just I just need to touch on here. So through everything, <laughs> there's been one constant. Through whether you're here, whether you're in Omaha, whether you're working pop stations, country stations, working in Boston, whatever. There's been one constant in your life. And I need to get to the bottom of it. Why so much love for Hanson? <laughs> uh, because, um, well, it, I mean, honestly, you, you really want to know? Because it comes back to exactly the first thing that we talked about. Go, yeah, go uh, for it. So, yeah, so 1997, I can remember being, uh, we, we would always go shopping, my mom and I, with my, my Aunt Peg, who was my great aunt, 
uh, and she happens to be my grandma's sister. So she's the, my grandma who passed away well, when I was little. Now, on one of these shopping trips, we were in the Walmart in East Greenbush. I remember this very vividly. Uh, and there's the, the debut album is sitting there. And with my own money, I said to my mom, you know, here I am 12, 13 years old. I, I think I want to get the CD. And she's like, well, you don't, how many songs do you know off of it? You might not, you know, because back then you couldn't hear anything at a time. And I was like, you know what, but I still want to buy it. Um, so I bought it and I fell in love instantly. And the final track before you get to the bonus on, on the CD is so, uh, called a song with, it's a song called With You In Your Dreams. And you hear 13 year old little Taylor Hansen singing a song that they wrote about their grandmother who passed away. Um, so I remember being 13 and starting to cry in my bedroom because I related to it so hard. Uh, and from that moment on, like, I just had a connection. They have literally been the constant for every up and down in my life. Um, you know, because while a lot of people don't realize it, they're on their seventh studio album. I think that's going to be coming out next month or, uh, in November. Um, so all the ups and downs, everything in between, any celebration, any time where I've been at my lowest, that's a, that's a band that I can go back to that fills every void, fills every, every crevice. Um, and nobody has to understand it, but we all have something like that in our lives for each one of us that helps us get through and helps us, um, make life a little bit easier. Um, so that's mine, you know? And, uh, I always say to people when they start making fun of me, I'm like, ah, if you don't, if you only know Umbab, you don't know the band at all. Uh, so, uh, that's, you know, if any, if, if anybody's watching right now, go ahead, search against the world, go send, uh, search the, uh, the song stronger. Uh, that's going to be off the new album. Both videos are on YouTube right now. And I think you will have a different experience than you, uh, expect to. Not the story you were expecting, huh? <laughs> not the beginning of it. No, I did not expect that beginning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which, it, it's interesting that you bring up, you know, something that you can come back to no matter what's going on in your life. Because I've had that feeling in recent years about a certain artist. And it's actually an artist that I'm not afraid to admit you put me on to very early on um, when he was just getting out there. And you might know who I'm referring to. Um, Mark Rousseau. Because no, no, uh, it's it's somebody. No, I'll, somebody I'll, I'll I'll give you I'll, I'll give you a hint. He had a concert at one point on a local college campus that I couldn't make to, but you went to. And grammar. Yep, yep. I I I don't know what it is, but I just. I just keep finding myself circling back to all the stuff he's done in recent years. And like, that's like my go-to thing, man. That, 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 that's my go-to thing where, you know, no matter what's going on, I can circle back to his music and it just, it, 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 it brings me, it feel, makes me feel more centered, I guess would be the best way to put it. So, um, but let's get into like, the, he's the a very stuff. positive human being. Like that's like, Oh God. Yeah. Is in his music is exactly who he is in life. You know, cause he's, he's dealt with a lot of crap too, you know, and he's, he's somebody who has had major success. And then it's like the next song comes out and he has to fight for it all over again. So, I mean, I, you know, there are certain people that I look at in different industries where I'm like, I feel like I can relate so hard to them because it's, it's the similar kind of feeling that I've had in my own career where it's like, you prove yourself, but then you have to do it all over again, you know? And it's like, at some point it shouldn't be so hard. Uh, but I look at Andy Grammer when I go, when I look at basketball, I look at Isaiah Thomas and everything that he did with the Celtics. And that was just, I know he had an injury, but he still does some amazing things. And he's just been so overlooked by so many teams that he's not even in the league anymore. Uh, and it's just mind blowing to me. Um, but you know, it, it, that's why somebody 
and, and he's also a very positive human being. So it's like, how do you see somebody that keeps having such struggle be so positive? Uh, but that's why it's so good to be able to connect with somebody like that, because it, like when they exude that positivity, even when they're struggling, it just proves that you can too, if you switch your mindset a little bit. You know, you can always focus more on the positive if you, if you allow yourself to. But we, we as humans get trained to focus on negatives all the time. You know, and we're, our, we're, we're worse to ourselves, you know, because we talk to ourselves the most. We tend to say some of the most negative stuff to ourselves that um, if we just flip that script a little bit and all of a sudden we start talking in a more positive manner to ourselves, you know, it starts to seek, you know, from the inside out. And I think that's what happens with a grammar. And that might be why you connect with him so much, uh, because he is somebody who is probably speaking very positively to himself. Uh, and it just it just radiates from him. Yeah, yeah, you edit that on because you always do. It is what it is. Um, <laughs> so let's just get right to where we are now. You know, you mentioned everything you're doing with all the different stations, the audiobook stuff, the voice coaching, life coaching, uh, being able to talk to animals, like, uh, you know, just, I don't know. You're doing, you're doing all kinds of different stuff. Um, with all the stuff that you do have going on, you know, how, how are you doing right now in the moment as Marissa? How are you? Um, I, you know, this is the thing is a lot of people, the like people that know me the best, um, this was actually just said to me yesterday is like, you know, you always have a lot of stuff that seems to happen, but you always bounce right back. And I always feel like that's like the nicest compliment anybody can say is like, but you always bounce right back. And, um, you know, I'm glad that that shows because I, I mean, yeah, I, I feel like I'm constantly on a roller coaster uh, and it's not anything of my own doing. It, it's usually, it's just like this weird path that I'm on. Uh, but as an example, like, you know, this pandemic happened, I ended up being home. I wasn't sure what was going to be next. And I worked at uh, a hardware company there for a moment and doing overnights. And I ended up thought I was being hired to stock shelves. And in reality, I was hired to uh, do a store reset they didn't hire enough people. So we had a very small team to get things done rather fast. And um, I was working with a bunch of guys. I think there was like maybe one other girl on the team. Uh, maybe. Uh, I'm not even 100% sure if that's accurate. <laughs> um, but uh, basically, I was in my last week and I was working in the lumber department. And like the biggest steel grates are in that section because of what it has to hold up. And somebody, as I was bending down to grab mine, accidentally dropped theirs above me uh, because I didn't realize, I thought they were letting me go first. And next thing you knew, I had a concussion. Uh, you know, here I was working in a job that I really shouldn't have been working in. I, I shouldn't have had to, but you know, it's pandemic and you do what you gotta do. And I got hit in the head and I, I've been dealing with concussion symptoms ever since, um, you know, and, and some other medical issues that I believe are stemming from it. So I've had some pretty rough days, to be honest. Um, not necessarily mental health wise, uh, but I've, I've been dealing with like some super fatigue, uh, you know, and every once in a while I've got some issues in my eye that have been going on. Um, but again, like I try everything I can to not let anything hold me back. Uh, so, you know, even with all that, like I started a new job, you know, I started a new full-time job and that's the, the vocal coaching that I'm doing uh, with a recording studio based out of Albany. I do a lot of that work right here from home. A lot of the classes I teach are on Zoom, so it makes it rather uh, accommodating for all the other stuff that I do do. Um, so in the meantime, as that progressed, so I, I started the vocal coach job back in February. By April, I was back on the radio in Boston uh, doing that part-time. In the last month and a half, I picked up three additional stations, one that I'm doing part-time in Burlington, Vermont, another that's... Uh, I'm doing nights in Lexington, Kentucky, another one that I'm doing middays in uh, Syracuse, New York. Um, so, and then I do some commercials and like a lot of things. So uh, if anything, I'm, <laughs> I, mental health wise, I feel okay. <laughs> I'm very tired. Uh, you know, that's really what it comes down to. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, a little sleepy, you know? <laughs> well, you, you, I mean, 
like you said, though, you pull it off very well for people not to know just how it's affecting you. So, you know, if as long as you're enjoying it and it's not negatively affecting you, <laughs> who the hell is one to judge, you know? Am I right? Yeah, I mean, I can't say that every day is my favorite day, uh, but, you know, it's it's an interesting life to be. I, I feel very privileged in, an, in a time of our lives where, you know, a lot of things happened in the radio industry over the last year and a half. I mean, with this pandemic, I mean, what people don't realize is, you know, radio is relying on advertising. Uh, every other company was struggling. So guess what stopped? The advertising, right? So like radio got hit extremely really hard in the last year and a half of this pandemic. So many of our friends and, and um, just, you know, co-conspirators, if you will, across the country got let go and technology started slowly taking over. And, you know, it's for me to be able to say, I have four radio stations that I'm right on right now. I feel privileged. I feel honored uh, that I'm wanted, that there seems to be a slight demand that, that I can still do it and do it comfortably and do it safely and, um, you know, happily, uh, you know, from the comfort of my own home. Uh, it's a weird situation to be in, but I will welcome it with open arms just because this is an incredibly odd time to be alive. <laughs> um, so the fact that I can do everything and do everything comfortably and safely and still say that I'm living my dream. Um, it, it, it makes me feel blessed. It makes me feel happy. You're muted. I, I, I really am hating myself today for constantly muting my <laughs> mic. <sighs> I will eventually remember to do this. Probably by the podcast I do tomorrow, I'll remember to stop muting my mic. Anyways, um, so to wrap it up, I'm just going to put this out there. Um, you know, I've gone through stuff the last few years, you've gone through stuff. And um, it's weird because you, you you never know you never know as you go through life who the ones are going to be the true ones that stick with you through time, and the ones that are going to be you know quick hitters in and out of your life. And I'm I'm personally blessed. To have, have had the experiences, whether they were good or bad, that allowed us to meet and become friends. Because, and I'm not, I'm not trying to blow up your ego at all. You really are one of the absolute best human beings I've met in my life. And, um, and I really do look at you as like a sister, and that's never going to change. And I love you for it. And um, I really do wish you absolutely nothing but the best with everything you're doing, no matter what direction it takes you. And I really do hope that uh, <clears throat> I really do hope that you, um, you know, you you do nothing but amazing things going forward, and that uh, everything goes well. And we definitely got to keep in touch a lot better. And that's on me. And I'll uh, I'll make sure I live up to that. Hey, I, I push the same thing right back at you, brother. Um, you know, I'm glad that you don't think I'm a miserable bitch anymore. So thanks for that. I appreciate that. Uh, You're very welcome. Uh, I, I hope that, you know, whether it's this podcast, whether it's something else, you know, you, you continue to do everything that you that you aspire to and you become the, the absolute best you that you ever can. Because if anybody deserves it, it is you, my friend. Uh, so I'm glad to be able to call you family. Uh, and I hope that I get to see you in more than just this capacity sometime soon. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll definitely work on that. Um, because the, the weird part, I feel like over the last four years, I've seen more of your father than I've seen of you personally, which. Well, let's get you both gamble. That's what happens, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, that, 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 
Thank you. Thank you for reminding me of why. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely work on that. It's that it. I'm gonna make it happen. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sounds All right. good to me. All right, so that does it for this edition of The Space Between Your Ears. A special thank you to Marissa Lanchak for being a part of the show. Presented by Godzilla Media, sponsored by Mohawk Honda and Johnstone Supply. Until next time, be safe, everyone. Later. <laughs>